Welcome everyone to this briefing brought to you by the Israel Defense and Security Forum, IDSF. In Hebrew, our name is Abitronistim. IDSF is the leading Israeli organization advocating for strong national security policies to guide the state of Israel. Thank you, of course, to all of our viewers and supporters for tuning into these briefings. It's a great pleasure today to be joined by Brigadier General Yossi Cooperwasser, the former head of the research division at the Israel Defense Forces Intelligence Corps, as well as the Director General of the Ministry of Strategic Affairs. During his military service, he served, among other positions, as the Central Command's Intelligence Officer and as the Intelligence Attaché to the United States. He also participated in the Yom Kippur War and the First Lebanon War. General, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. There are many points I want to try to address uh, in our limited time together. The first, which I think is on many people's minds, is this attack of uh, the, the killing of these three top Iranian commanders in Syria. Are you able to comment about how crippling their deaths are to Iran? And what extent can Israel brace itself for a direct attack from Iran? Well, definitely a very important uh, attack that uh, caused a lot of damage to the Iranians. Uh, I think for the at least for the short run, the effort to use Syria as a platform through which they arm Hezbollah, the Palestinians, and other forces in Syria itself uh, is going to suffer a little bit because these were the people with all the knowledge and experience that was so important for them to uh, promote this effort for a long time. And these are very high-ranking uh, officers, so uh, I think it's a, it's a very painful blow for the prestige of Iran and for the leadership of Iran. So definitely the Iranians are now uh, trying to figure out what, what uh, is, best, uh, is the best uh, reaction to this uh, attack. Of course, they attribute it to Israel, and I think everybody does. So uh, they have to, to figure out what to do. So I think that... Uh, they first of all have to figure out why Israel has chosen this uh, timing uh, for the for that attack. What does Israel mean to to achieve through that? And I think the the reason Israel did it because I guess Israel knew about this uh, this location, this facility for quite a while, and uh, maybe there was an opportunity here. But uh, it's more than just an opportunity. That's uh, this is a strategic decision to to launch such an attack. In my mind. What the Iranians might think is that, okay, the envelope of the rules of the game is being stretched. And uh, yes, Israel attacked uh, Iranians in Syria, which uh, happens from time to time. And yes, Israel did it in the context of trying to prevent Iran from delivering weapons to Hezbollah and to other proxies. But it definitely stretches the uh, limits of this, uh, of this envelope of uh, rules of the game in Syria. And uh, I think that the understanding of the Iranians is going to be that this was uh, decided upon by Israel uh, because they themselves were trying to stretch the limits of these rules of the game uh, in recent days. They did two things that uh, were interpreted in Israel as uh, demanding some sort of a different reaction. One was the launching of uh, the uh, unmanned uh, air vehicle, uh, exploding uh, air vehicle towards uh, Eilat from uh, from Iraq uh, that uh, hit uh, an Israeli uh, base in, in the Eilat area. And uh, the second uh, was the sending of the attempt to send uh, very advanced weaponry to the Palestinians in the areas controlled by the Palestinian Authority. So uh, these were two elements that were new in the Iranian uh, uh, ways, way of uh, fighting against Israel. And uh, Israel uh, has retaliated by uh, stretching its uh, envelope, its part of the envelope in uh, carrying out this attack. Now, the Iranians have to ex decide whether they are going to move back uh, and uh, retaliate within the confines of this envelope, namely more, more attempt by the uh, Iraqi forces to launch more UAVs to Israel or something like that, and uh, more attacks from Hezbollah and uh, the rest of the things that are within this envelope? Or should they go and uh, do something bigger? They have to take into account that uh, it might be that Israel was is prepared for something bigger and that uh, this may be very costly for the Iranians themselves if Israel is ready and is able to foil the attempts. 
So it's uh, the Iranians are sitting on this issue as we as we speak and trying to figure out. We have to anyhow be prepared for any kind of reaction that the Iranians may choose. And uh, the Iranian rationale is being challenged with something new that they have not uh, been experiencing in the last uh, five months, six months, as a matter of fact, that elapsed since the beginning of the war. So they have to uh, really think hard. And it's very difficult to do, to predict what they're going to what are they going to do, and that's why we have to be prepared for any eventuality, any decision. Uh, I think the Israelis, I hope the Israelis took that into account before launching the attack, and uh, are ready to face also other things that they can do beyond more of the same. Uh, amongst the other things that we have to be prepared to is uh, all kinds of attempts to hit Israeli uh, targets abroad, which is something that the Iranians have done in the past, all kinds of uh, attacks on cyber, uh, and uh, of course also, in, uh, which is in low probability, but still we have to be prepared to, an attempt to hit Israel directly from Iran. I don't think that uh, this is highly probable, but it's possible, and we can't rule it out. We have to be prepared for that too, and uh, the Iranians, of course, are trying to send send signals that uh, this is within their uh, considerations. They have not decided, but uh, they might do that. And uh, we have a lot of information coming in that uh, there are preparations and uh, they're getting ready. I don't know if they're going to actually use it, but we have to take this very seriously. Has uh, Hezbollah's operational capacity been degraded by what just happened uh, in Syria? Not yet. It was not degraded, but it might affect its ability, the ability of Iran to build further capabilities for Hezbollah, because uh, we keep uh, hitting the uh, shipments of arms on the way to see, to Hezbollah, and now we uh, caused a lot of damage to the leadership of this effort, as I said before. So I think that uh, it's going to be more difficult for them to deliver arms to Hezbollah. Uh, at the same time, we keep uh, hitting targets uh, in Lebanon. Uh, from time to time, these targets are uh, extremely valuable, including uh, key personnel, key figures in the Hezbollah military forces, uh, terror forces. Uh, we hit uh, several people from the Radwan force, uh, including the people that are involved in the launching of their anti-tank missiles and the, uh, those who are involved in uh, other operations. We hit uh, people from the unit that is responsible for launching the rockets, and we definitely managed to uh, uh, cause some harm to their uh, anti-aircraft uh, unit, including uh, targets in the farther north in the Baka Valley, and also against their uh, infrastructure that is being that is used in order to launch UAVs towards Israel all the time. So they are suffering, and they also lost more than 250, according to their numbers, they lost more than 250 uh, terror activists uh, since the beginning of this war. So it's definitely a painful uh, price that they are paying uh, for their commitment to participate in the war and show solidarity with Hamas and uh, force Israel to de dedicate uh, some part of its forces to the northern front. They believe this is going to be on the expense of the southern front. I don't think so, but uh, uh, we have enough forces to to fight on both four fronts simultaneously. But uh, they believe that this is something they managed to do, and uh, they attribute to themselves the fact that Israel has uh, uh, took has taken some some of its uh, forces from the south and sent it to the north. So they feel that uh, they can go on with that. But, but we make sure that they pay a very heavy price for that. And uh, as I said, these are the elements that, of the price they paid, including very high-ranking uh, terrorists. Now, it was just announced on Monday that Israel has increased its emergency stockpile of raw materials to more than two billion shekel worth in the past few months to prepare for a potential all-out war with Hezbollah. When it came to Hamas, Israel was not prepared for war. Do you think that Israel's prepared now for war with Hezbollah? Well, I think Israel is better prepared now than it was uh, five months ago. Uh, I wrote a, a piece that I shared with some decision makers before the war that uh, said that we have to be better prepared for a war because the war is becoming more and more imminent. 
and uh, well, there was following this paper, there was a debate of whether how how bad how bad is, it, is our situation if the if a war breaks out. Uh, so it's uh, I'm sure that now we are much better uh, prepared. We are prepared not only from the point of view of uh, stockpiles of. Uh, essential uh, commodities, but also from the point of view of uh, uh, weaponry, we are better prepared from the point of view of uh, military preparedness uh, of the units. Uh, they're all practicing. There are a lot of training uh, going on uh, in, in the context of a northern scenario. So I'm sure that everybody is better prepared. This doesn't mean that we are seeking war. If we, we have, if you seek peace, you have to be prepared for war. That's uh, uh, that's the, the famous saying, and I think that's what we're, what we're doing. We are preparing ourselves to war, hoping that this will convince uh, Hezbollah to uh, uh, go for some sort of an arrangement that uh, would make sure that uh, the people of the northern villages of Israel, northern communities, will be able to go back to their uh, villages and live there safely. And uh, if Hezbollah is going to uh, be ready to accept such an arrangement, we can avoid the war in the north. Everybody is under the impression that the chances that of that happening is not very high. I agree, it's not very high, but it's not zero. And we have to do whatever we can in order to raise the chances that this is going to be the case. And all these preparations and the stockpiling the, the necessary foodstuff and whatever is, uh, is uh, something that's going to help us convince Hezbollah that we are prepared for a war and make them uh, more uh, open to listening to new to diplomatic ideas how to uh, handle this conflict now israel seems to be uh, getting more and more assertive and aggressive in the north do you think it's more likely that an all out war uh, would be started by hezbollah or would it be israel to do that and what would that look like what is the turning point of this back and forth skirmish over the border versus an all out war in the north well, you know, we are in a in an ongoing low, uh, middle, and medium intensity war uh, with the with Hezbollah that uh, has the tendency of uh, escalating gradually, but in a controlled manner for five months now, more, actually six. We are so close to six months, and uh, that's uh, something that uh, both us and the Hezbollah showed their ability to control efficiently. Nobody lost uh, control and ran into something that uh, was forced upon him in spite of its will. Uh, it's not easy because mistakes can happen. We saw the mistake that we did with uh, uh, the food uh, workers in uh, in Gaza. Such a mistake uh, by Hezbollah or by us, or by, or by us can cause uh, escalation, uh, rapid escalation in, in the north uh, without the intention of any of the sides. So uh, we have to be prepared for such an uh, eventuality. Uh, right now, I don't think that uh, the turn from uh, this uh, ongoing medium medium level war uh, that is controlled by the side is going to happen because of Israel. We are now focused on the south. We have to make sure that we finish the job there. And uh, we believe that, uh, and I believe at least, that uh, the best way to have an impact on how the war is, uh, how the situation with Hezbollah is going to develop is to have a decisive victory in the south and to finish the job in, in the south. If we take Rafah, this is going to be the end of the major operations in, in the south. This would be going to be uh, a good point for Hezbollah to put an end to the war and maybe consider seriously a uh, diplomatic solution. So uh, otherwise, they know that we are now much more capable of moving our uh, entire might northwards. And uh, this is something they want to avoid. So uh, I think that uh, for the time being, we are focused there. Can Hezbollah decide to uh, escalate? Of course they can. They know what are the prices. Uh, until now, they've decided not to do that. They don't uh, uh, send messages that they are going to change it anytime soon. But uh, we have to understand that uh, all kinds of considerations go in the mind of uh, Nasrallah, including what is the situation of the Iranians. The Iranians were now uh, in a hit uh, seriously, as uh, I just uh, mentioned uh, before, and uh, Hezbollah may feel that they have to do something to show solidarity with Iran, not only with, uh, uh, with Hamas, and especially as the, those people who were killed in the, in the attack in Damascus, 
who were very close to Hezbollah, were very much uh, deeply involved in supporting Hezbollah. They may consider that something that they have to take part in the retaliation to this uh, attack and uh, escalate a little bit more. And God knows, once you break this envelope of uh, rules of the game that I mentioned before, Hezbollah can do it as well on behalf of the Iranians, and this may cause the uh, uh, wider escalation in the north. Thank you. I want to pause for a moment just to thank all of our viewers who are tuning into this briefing and sending in their questions. We, we greatly appreciate your support and your questions, and it helps guide us in terms of what topics to cover and who to bring on to these briefings. And a reminder uh, to all of our viewers, if you appreciate it and learn from these briefings, of course, feel free to spread the word and encourage your family and friends to sign up as well. And a good number of our viewers brought to my attention an article that was widely circulated in the Wall Street Journal. General, I'd like to ask you about this article because uh, the author uh, really criticized Israel's operations in Gaza in, in four or five very significant ways. And I want to try to address some of those right now. So first off, uh, this article in the Wall Street Journal uh, suggested that Israel should have spent more time planning its operations rather than rushing uh, into Gaza, and I'm not expressing my opinion, I'm merely uh, using his wording. Uh, and in spending more time in preparing for Gaza operation, there should have been more of a focus on understanding the intelligence failure rather than rush into a ground assault. Are you able to uh, comment uh, on that approach? Well, I think basically he's right. Uh, we should, uh, it's always better to spend a lot of time on planning. Uh, but sometimes, uh, it's not uh, totally, you don't have the entire freedom to choose how much time you're going to spend on planning because uh, in this case, this war was forced upon us. We didn't prepare for this war and that he, he's right. Uh, the article is right in, in pointing that uh, we should have been better prepared and uh, spend more time on, for that. I wrote a piece, a uh, very famous piece, uh, Disarming Gaza. Uh, I wrote it in June 2023 and I called the, the government of Israel to sit down and prepare or plan for a war in Gaza that would uh, deprive Hamas from the ability to arm itself because, and I said at the time, that if we do that properly, uh, yes, we are going to pay a heavy price doing that, but uh, the price where we are going to pay if we don't do that is going to be uh, twice or thrice the price that we pay for doing that. And uh, yes, they, they should have planned that at that time. That said, once the war was forced upon us, we spent the appropriate time. We, we couldn't postpone it more than the time we postponed it because they were building up uh, the pressures on us not to carry out the ground operation. And we should have started it. And I think we began it on time. Uh, we couldn't we couldn't wait more. And we did it in a very impressive way. I think the, the military and everybody in Israel is very uh, appreciative of uh, what we did. Regarding the question of uh, uh, investigating the intelligence failure before you go to the war, uh, we have to make a differentiation between what we have to investigate and what we have to uh, fight upon, uh, the intelligence we have to fight upon. What we had to investigate was the failure of early warning, the failure that was made of uh, three layers. One, understanding the enemy. Second, uh, understanding its capabilities. Third, having the capability to uh, have an early warning on time based on intelligence collection that would uh, fit the understanding of the strategic and operational levels of intelligence. That was a major failure that we had because of two terrible conceptions that we had, that we had both about the enemy and about ourselves, combined with two terrible mistakes that we did on the night before the 7th of October, that we didn't... Uh, uh, sound the alarm when we were when we had information that said something is wrong and we, instead of sound, sounding the alarm we went to sleep to until 8.30 in the morning and uh, the, another reason of this failure was that we didn't know what we know we didn't know about the, the big plan of Hamas in, in details but the people who were discussing what to do were not aware of that while they were discussing it that was a terrible, uh, terrible mistake that uh, caused us uh, so much uh, casualties, so many casualties. But uh, but this has little to do with the question of what you do once you enter the war. 
It's a, it's a different kind of information, different kind of intelligence that you need for fighting the war. And the war uh, and the internet intelligence for fighting the war was, I wouldn't say perfect, but was sufficient. And uh, that's why we were able to fight the war successfully and surprise the enemy again and again and again and again. Uh, we managed to reach Shifa for the first time, we managed to reach Shifa for the second time, just on time in a very uh, efficient way. We managed to uh, enter Shati refugee camp on time because we knew where they were and how they were prepared to uh, face us. Uh, we knew a lot. It doesn't mean that the intelligence was perfect. As I said, uh, we, we had many gaps. This is the way intelligence operates. You just have to be able to uh, close the gaps. And uh, we did a big effort to do that. Uh, we used the, uh, We wouldn't be able to close the gaps without the military operation. Because the military operation enabled us to reach all kinds of uh, uh, piles of information that was waiting for us over there, and to take uh, uh, captives, many operati operatives of uh, Hamas that gave us a lot of information during the war, and this uh, enabled us to close the gaps. So uh, I think that the operation was uh, carried out on time. One, we could have done something better if we have started with Rafah instead of finishing with Rafah. Maybe the, the better way of doing that was to, to begin with Rafah. But uh, this is already water under the bridge. So uh, now we have to deal with Rafah with the situation that prevails there now. Now, another major claim in this article is that Israel should have spent more time on public diplomacy um, rather than... Uh, jump into war, and that without sufficient day after planning, uh, this war is really uh, for naught and not going to be uh, successful. What, what are your thoughts on that, please? Well, uh, his part, uh, to some extent, is correct. I think we didn't uh, put enough effort on uh, public uh, diplomacy. Uh, we should have done more. Uh, we were not um, attentive enough to the order of priorities of the United States. Uh, the main battle is over President Biden. What President Biden, it's not a public diplomacy about the public opinion. It's, it's one part of it, but it's a part of it because the public opinion have an impact on President Biden. And uh, what's really important for Israel is what does President Biden think about the war? And we didn't uh, pay enough attention in my mind to the fact that from President Biden's point of view, the most important thing right from the beginning was to make sure that this war does not involve more suffering to the Palestinian people in Gaza. And he adopted the, the, the idea that uh, the population in Gaza is not uh, represented by Hamas and that uh, this was right from the beginning. And he adopted the, the idea that uh, the... Uh, uh, Israel is not uh, uh, doing enough in order to bring in... Uh, humanitarian aid, and uh, Israel is not careful enough uh, regarding uh, avoiding uh, civilian casualties. He, he was using, even though it, it, until some point he was saying these are Hamas figures or the Ministry of Health of Hamas in Gaza, but uh, right from the beginning they, they adopted the, the numbers that, provided, that were provided by Hamas, forgetting to note that uh, many of those casualties are actually terrorists. Uh, and uh, and the from the American point of view, this was not less important, maybe even more important to avoid the uh, suffering for the pal pal Palestinian population in Gaza than releasing the hostages and defeating Hamas. Not that they are uh, not supporting the, these two targets. Of course, they do. But uh, they are as important as the Palestinian safety, Palestinian population safety and well-being, and if not, uh, a little bit less. We were not uh, paying attention to that. We were so much uh, consumed by the need to defeat Hamas, the need to release the hostages, uh, then the need to use the defeating of Hamas in order to release the hostages. And uh, we are paying a price for that because uh, I saw the president uh, reaction to what happened in Daniel Balak with the uh, world uh, kitchen uh, workers. Uh, this is... Uh, I mean, the, the way he referred to that was really reflecting uh, a very problematic attitude from an Israeli point of view. And uh, we uh, should have done more. 
regarding the day after, uh, yes, I think that uh, we should have been clearer from the beginning. I mean, the prime minister is quite clear, but uh, his position was not adopted yet by the government. And I think we should be clear that uh, we want to make sure that Gaza in the future we shall not be able to be a launching pad of terror attacks against Israel. And for that uh, reason, we cannot allow the Palestinian Authority that supports uh, terrorism, that didn't condemn the 7th of October uh, massacre, that uh, incites uh, terror, that, supply, that pays salaries to terrorists, that is at the same time uh, a very weak uh, entity that uh, doesn't have any strong uh, ability to govern uh, Gaza in the future. Uh, we, we should say that uh, and uh, any delivering uh, of authorities in the, in the responsibility for Gaza to the Palestinian Authority will mean that uh, soon after Hamas will take over again. Uh, we should have been clear that uh, this is unacceptable. The prime minister was, the rest of the government, uh, we have a coalition government, so it's not easy to uh, to reach an agreement even within the government. And the rest of the government did not adopt until now the paper issued by uh, by, by the prime minister. Gali Eisenkot just presented a paper of his own that is not actually that different from the prime minister uh, paper. But even in the prime minister paper, that doesn't state uh, clearly that that the Palestinian Authority cannot come back to to Gaza, and uh, people are still playing with this uh, idea. And uh, the fact that Israel doesn't say that is it's ready to establish some sort of uh, civilian administration in in Gaza that would uh, help the Palestinians to prepare themselves for self rule of Gaza uh, by people who are not involved in terrorism. Uh, is like uh, trying to have a free lunch. And uh, unfortunately, there is no free lunch. And uh, we have to be ready to, to establish a civilian administration, civil administration in Gaza by the military for a uh, short period of time, let's say something like up to a year, in which we shall uh, uh, help uh, those Palestinians after they are convinced that Hamas is not coming back, that uh, they can... Uh, uh, come out of uh, where they hide today and say, okay, I'm ready to handle the situation in Gaza. Uh, if you promise me that Hamas is not coming back, uh, then uh, until then we should have uh, control of Gaza. On top of, uh, I mean, the one thing that everybody in Israel agrees upon is that uh, Israel should have the uh, overall uh, security responsibility for Gaza, and that, that the military, the IDF, should have the, the ability to operate in Gaza freely. Whenever they, whenever we have an information about the terror uh, sale or any terror activity, we should be able to deal with it, and that we should be able to uh, to control the southern border and the border with Israel. This is uh, agreed upon in Israel by everybody. But uh, who is going to be the Palestinian side that's going to have a role there, and who? What is the role that uh, would be given to the international community? and to the uh, Arab uh, moderate uh, states, this is still uh, in the working. And uh, we cannot blame anybody for not uh, having a plan for that in, in advance. We, and we shouldn't have waited for such a plan before we started the military operations. But we should have, uh, by now, by after six months of, uh, of war, we should have uh, been able to, to present uh, a program for the plan for the day after. Brigadier General Yossi Cooper Wasser, thank you so much for joining this briefing. It's a great pleasure to be able to hear and learn from you. Thank you to all of our viewers and supporters for tuning into this briefing. We will be back with you tomorrow, 10 a.m. Eastern Time. Until then, stay safe, stay strong. Take care, everyone. Thank you.